Hey everyone, welcome to tonight's webinar. This is our Michigan State University Beekeeping Office Hours webinar. Um, so this is our webinar for the month of May. We're really happy that you're here to learn more about beekeeping. Uh, my name is Anna Heck. I'm an apiculture extension educator. Megan, do you want to introduce yourself? I'm Megan Milbrath. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Entomology. And Dan? Dan Wines. I'm a specialist also in the Department of Entomology. Great. So we're excited to be here today. Um, I'm going to get us started by um, sharing some resources and then we'll jump into some seasonal beekeeping topics. And then after that, we'll have lots of time to answer your beekeeping questions. All right. So uh, this is an MSU extension program. Our programs are open to everyone. And here is what we have on our agenda. Uh, we'll talk about resources and ways to stay connected to our programs. Then we'll talk about swarms queen events, drawing calm, managing space, managing varroa, and then jump into questions and answers. So to get us started, um, if you are watching this webinar live, we send a lot of links and resources through the chat box. If you are on a computer or a tablet or uh, your phone through the Zoom app, you'll find a little icon that has a little text bubble and then says chat. And that's where you'll find the links that we're sharing tonight. Um, so I know sometimes they just pop up on the screen for briefly when we send them, but then if you click the chat box, you should be able to see all the links that we've sent. Uh, we also include the links when we post the webinar recordings. Um, so if you watch the webinar recording on YouTube, you'll be able to go to the description box and see the full list of links that we shared during the webinar. Um, so we post our webinars on, um, or this year's webinars on our YouTube channel. So it's the Michigan State University Beekeeping YouTube channel. We are recording tonight. We will post this recording on our YouTube channel. It does take us a few days though to get the recording uploaded because we sometimes have some editing to do and we need to add closed captionings, which um, is part of our trying to make sure that all of our resources online for online videos are accessible. So it does take us a little while to sometimes get that recording up there, but you'll be able to find this recording um, on our Michigan State University Beekeeping YouTube channel. Uh, the April webinar is on the YouTube channel. You're welcome to check that video out if you missed our webinar. And then um, we'll jump into some resources for you. So uh, Michigan is lucky that we have lots of beekeeping clubs. We have over 30 Michigan beekeeping clubs. And uh, the way to find your local club is to go to our statewide organization's website, Michigan Beekeepers Association. So it's michiganbees.org. And there on their page, they have a link that says Michigan Bee Clubs, and that's where you'll be able to look based off location to find a club near you. And these clubs typically meet monthly. Every club's a little bit different, but they try to provide lots of local information and resources to their members. MSU has a website. Uh, our website is pollinators.msu.edu. Um, if you go to that page and then click events, you'll find our uh, upcoming events. We, um, you'll also see a shorter link or a QR code on the side of the screen to pull up that page directly. We have a lot of upcoming events that are advertised on that page. So that includes things like webinars, um, in-person presentations, especially to beekeeping clubs, and then workshops that we do. Um, so I'm just going to highlight a few of the upcoming events that we have going on. So one our thing is our upcoming office hour webinars. We're doing these monthly through the beekeeping season. Um, so they're all on Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern, our next one will be on June 26th. Uh, some other things that we want to highlight are our beekeeping workshops. So we scheduled several in-hive beekeeping workshops throughout the season at a few different locations. And um, this is a place where we expect you to be able to come, get some experience looking at colonies with us, knowing how we inspect a colony, hive handling, what we look for during an inspection, how to monitor for varroa mites, and just seasonal information about beekeeping. So if you're someone who is kind of learning beekeeping this year and not yet keeping your own bees, this is a great way to get some hands-on experience before buying bees. Also, if you're new to beekeeping and you haven't had a lot of experience seeing other colonies or really don't know exactly what to look for, we hope that you sign up for one of these workshops. Um, some other workshops that we're excited about are hygienic testing workshop, which will be Friday, June 16th in the afternoon. And then our queen rearing workshop, which will be all day long on Saturday, June 17th. For all of these workshops, registration is required, and there's more information on the events page. 
Um, we are also going to attend the Michigan Honey Festival that will be held Saturday, July 15th and Sunday, July 16th at the Shiawassee County Fairgrounds. Um, so that's an annual event. That's all things honey. There's um, normally lots of stuff on bees and planting for bees. And then we're also really excited that this year MSU's Bee Palooza is back on campus. So that's scheduled for Sunday, August 13th from 1 to 4 p.m. in the MSU Horticulture Gardens. Uh, more information on that is on our event page. This is really meant to be an educational event or fair that's uh, for all ages with lots of different pollinators and bees represented. All right, so uh, in partnership with Michigan Beekeepers Association, we are doing a survey to hear more about what beekeepers want in terms of education and programs. And so these um, the responses from these surveys are going to be used in helping us determine topics for future conference sessions um, and other educational programs. So some of you may have already received this survey via email if you are on the Michigan Beekeepers Association's contact list. Um, if you have not already taken the survey, we'd love for you to take it. There is a QR code on the screen and then there's also um, the URL code at the bottom there. And that will link to a short article on the survey with an explanation and then you'll find the link to do the survey on that art, on that page. Uh, we're keeping the survey open through the end of the month and really, uh, really looking forward to hearing your ideas and responses. All right, so a lot of this information we share through our newsletter digest. Um, so that includes upcoming events and then any articles that are recent that we publish. You can find those by going to our website, pollinators.msu.edu, clicking Stay Connected, and there you'll find a, a form to sign up for um, Pollinators and Pollination News Digest. There's also tons of other cool topics that you can learn more about from MSU Extension. Um, so the kind of instructions are on the screen, and then you'll see the QR code there as well in case you want to pull that up through your phone. All right. Uh, so tonight, if you have questions about beekeeping, please use the Q&A box to answer them. Um, so that is, or sorry, to ask your questions. So that should be in your Zoom controls. That's where we like you to put your beekeeping questions and we'll go through those questions at the end of the webinar. Um, but if you're watching this as a recording or if you have questions between webinars, the best way for you to ask them is through a form on our website. So pollinators.msu.edu slash questions. There you'll find an ask extension form where you're able to type your question and upload photos. And we're, that's the best way for us as a team to respond. This is Megan's topic of swarms. So this morning um, when we were deciding to talk about swarms, I was like, oh, what are we going to talk about? And then we got, I think I got three swarm calls today, plus one of our colonies on campus swarmed. Um, which is a little embarrassing because we do teach a lot about doing swarm control, but where we are on main campus in Lansing, there's definitely lots of swarms that are happening. Um, so I think we have a couple post pictures posted here, but we do removals. The one we did, um, we don't normally do removals as part of MSU. What we mainly do is send people to MBA um, with the website, which we'll talk about getting listed there as well. Um, but we do definitely recommend that beekeepers go out and do removals as just part of a public service. Um, we don't want bees ending up in people's soffits and dormers and behind their sidings and or to get sprayed or for people to have them show up in places that they don't want to. Um, this is actually one that showed up at my farm last year and was really interesting because I was able to get video of a small hive beetle in this swarm that traveled with the swarm. And it wasn't from my operation, um, at least not at the, the home farm. Um, but yeah, so they're very, very fun. If you have not actually caught one yourself, it's really fun to go and start working with some people who are. And I'm sure there is someone in your bee club on Facebook who is offered to go get them. Or if you have questions on how you can actually collect them, um, that's something we can happily answer in this as well. Um, and we do have an article written for the public about what you should do if you find a swarm of bees. And really what we do is try to direct people to find a bee beekeeper to come and capture them. And when we get calls at MSU, we send them to the Michigan Beekeepers Association swarm map, um, which is the listing. So it's on michiganbees.org. 
The swarm map is for MBA members only. We do get a lot of requests for cutouts as well this time of year. And I believe, and Anna can correct me, that the um, cutout list you do not have to be a member to be a part of. But if you're willing to go get swarms, it's very helpful for us who field lots and lots of calls. Like I said, I had at least three today of swarms that were coming in. Um, and I always send them to this swarm list. So if you would like to get on the swarm list, um, I mean, join MBA, get on the list, and then we can send people your way as well. All right, this is my favorite topic. So the other thing that's happening at this time of year is queen events. Um, I'm definitely also getting lots of calls about people needing queens. There are a lot of people that just want them to do splits, which is really valid. Um, but there are a couple other things that are happening with queens as well. Um, so I think, and I address them all in this, this is on my, my personal website, which will probably get turned into an MSU article. Um, but the page is called uh, Help I Need a Queen. And honestly, it's a trap. So the goal was that um, I was getting a lot, or what happened is that a few years ago, I was getting a lot of requests from people saying that they need to find, they needed a queen and they, you know, help, I need a queen and they need a queen right now. And that's just never a situation that I found myself in. And so what I started to do is actually say, you know, I could sell you a queen, but can I come out and look at your hive and let you know? And in 100% of the cases, there was, it was not a situation in which they needed a queen. And there were two things that were happening is one is that the colony was in the process of requeening and the colony just needed to be left alone or the colony had been queenless for so long that it was already in a lane worker situation. And if you, I just added a queen, they would have killed it. So this, this tab, if you click on help, I need a queen, you'd think it would take you to a queen order form. And it actually takes you to a page that tells you really why you likely don't need a queen. Um, and there's a couple of photos next that'll explain some of the situations. So this is the main one, and this is actually not my diagram, but I um, posted it on the site. And the main point here is how long it takes for you to get a queen. So there are a few reasons why your colony would be queenless at this time of year or in the process of requeening. One really important one is that packages just often requeen. And we don't know why, but my theory is, is that, you know, the honeybees do replace queens when they have issues with brood patterns and things like that. When you have a brand new queen in a hive and there's no brood at all at a time of year that they should be brood because it's a package, which is just a bizarre situation, they maybe could be blaming her for that brood pattern. Or it could be something in shipping or something like that, but it's definitely common for queens in packages to get superseded once they start laying and the package gets established. The other thing is that if a colony doesn't swarm, it's super common for the colony to get replaced or to um, for them to replace the old queen right at the end of swarm season. So for a colony, it um, if they overwintered, let's say, or the queen's really old, right at the end of swarm season, so basically right now, is the time that they will naturally supersede her. So this is the recommendation of why it's best management to replace your queens in the fall. When this process happens, it takes months. Or if your colony has swarmed, you you could be looking at about a month before you would see any sign of a queen again. Um, and so that's why it is really important to figure out when is the last time you see emerging brood or when how long it's been there since you've seen a queen in that hive so the next slide like this is what we're looking for to confirm that we've had a queen is that we have eggs that are laid by a queen um and you know this is the indication that everything is okay like i said this could be a month or more after the queen has left either through a swarm before you would actually see this the other thing that's really common this time of year is what we see on the next slide where we have backfilling. So, and Dan's gonna talk about space issues a bit more, but this is super common in people who have second year hives where that first year the bees are drawing out wax and then the, um, they're really, really slow to grow. And then all of a sudden the second year, 
spring comes, it gets really, really lots of food comes in, the colony is really big, and that colony fills up way faster than you would expect. So this is a crowding issue. This hive, we can see that it has, you know, all of this capped worker brood on the outside, and then just filled with nectar and pollen on the inside. It's a nice, big, strong, healthy colony. The queen may be still totally fine and running out around in there. She just doesn't have any room to lay. So you wouldn't, and this I saw a lot, um, that you wouldn't have a queen, or you would have a queen, you would see no sign of her just because she doesn't have room to lay. Eventually, this colony would swarm because of a crowded swarm. Um, but what you would have to do to alleviate this is not necessarily add a queen in. She would just get killed. But to give them enough space that they can pull all of this nectar out of the brood nest, and then you'd be able to see whether or not there's actually, you know, once there's room for her to lay, then you can see if there's a queen. The other thing that you can do is add in a frame of brood. And this can do a few things. Is One is if you add in a frame of brood that's about to emerge, then there'll be immediately room for her to lay. Um, once those bees emerge. The other thing that you can do is on the next slide, you'll see queen cells. So this is the most important thing is if you're trying to figure out whether or not your colony is officially queenless, if you put a frame of eggs in there and they start to draw out some cells that look like this, which will happen within a day. So by the next day, then you would be officially queenless and you could go ahead and purchase a queen if you wanted, or you could let them continue to draw those cells, or you could combine that box of bees with another hive, you know, depending on how big it is. But this is really the only way to confirm that you're actually queenless. If you put a frame of brood in there and you don't see them drawing out queen cells, then in most cases they're in the process of requeening. And when they're in the process of requeening, um, a lot of times there'll be a virgin in the hive and if I am going through a hive, I suspect there's a virgin and I don't see the virgin. The only thing I've learned is that I didn't see a virgin. Um, they're very hard to spot. She could be out on a mating flight while you're digging in there and they've run around. They're hard to see. Um, so I really don't like to dig in the hive when I anticipate that they're in the process of requeening. So if you suspect that you have a colony that's queenless, um, you can put a frame of eggs in there. Otherwise, it's best to just close it up, figure out when the last time there was likely a queen, and walk away. There's other signs that indicate that the, something happened. So here's one where this is probably a very recent swarm, um, where you can see that the uh, cell on the left, a queen has just recently emerged, and the cell on the right, she was about to emerge or is maybe getting torn down. Um, on the next slide, you can see this is another example of queen cells. So um, most likely a single queen emerged out of one of these many cells and then came through and killed the queens on the inside of these and the workers tore them down. Um, so this would be the sign that you had a recent queen event. My phone's ringing and I bet it's a swarm call right now too. All right, so I'll put the article in the chat and then I'll answer more queen questions at the end as they come in. Awesome, thanks Megan. All right, next up is Dan with Managing Space. Yeah, so we have this, um, you know, we're, we're in this period of the year, we're mid, late May here when, in at least where I'm at in Michigan, and I would suspect through most of the state, there are abundant resources in the environment coming in. We've got warm temperatures. Our colonies are really in their their big spring growth period. Um, and part of that is, um, you know, depending on where you're at and your beekeeping progress and what you've got in your inventory, um, Getting, getting new comb drawn is really important. Drawn comb is a, is a super valuable resource to you as a beekeeper. Um, and so, so getting bees to make it is, is uh, really valuable. Um, you know, wh whether you've got like in this picture, we've got this, this is, you know, kind of a new small unit um, where we've got almost a full box of foundation put on top of a growing colony in the spring. Or if you've just purchased a a nuke or a package in like your first year beekeeper or your second year beekeeper that don't, you don't have a lot of growing comb up your sleeve, this is a really good window um, to get more frames drawn out. And think we, you know, if we think of the, you know, the colony as the organism, that they have to 
they have to make the wax. They have to draw out the comb. That's kind of like an animal filling out its skeleton before it can put on the muscle mass. Like it's got to have the physical structure where it can store the food, store, you know, store the honey, store the pollen, raise the next generation of bees. So none of that can happen without comb. Um, and this is a great time of year from, you know, early May through, um, in my experience, through, you know, mid, late June is, is kind of the, the prime window for getting comb drawn because your colonies are in this peak growth mode. Um, feeding can really uh, help this. Especially again, if you've got a nuclear package, you've got a, just a little baby colony that's starting out. They don't necessarily have a ton of foragers to go get, even if there's a lot of food in the environment. Just because it's a small population, they may not have the workforce to go get a lot of that. Um, but you can also kind of be observant based on what's coming in. Just um, personally, again, I'm in the Ingham Clinton County area, just around Lansing. And, you know, I made nukes about three weeks ago, around about the 1st of May, the last week of April, um, and both the parent colonies and the nukes got fed initially um, a couple times within a week. And then it was like we got into this run of good weather. The dandelions, um, nectar was really coming in. Now we're kind of into a um, black cherry and autumn. Also, I stopped feeding a couple weeks ago. and the, the bees are drawing comb fine the last few weeks, but it was to, you know, if you're wanting them to draw comb and there's not a lot flowering or the weather is cool, um, you know, feeding syrup, and I guess we're talking syrup, to be clear, feeding carbohydrates. Um, the bees, you need young bees to make wax. They've got about a, it's about a 10 day window early in their lifespan. It's like, a, I think around 11 or 12 days of bees wax glands develop. They can produce wax for about a week or so in their life, but it's really in like the 12 to 20 day window of any individual bee that it can physically produce that wax. Um, so we got a lot of young new bees emerging, got a lot of wax makers this time of year. So hopefully what you're seeing in your growing colonies is these nice new frames, uniform, um, like we see, you know, it's a really, it's a really striking geometry, just how they, when they get it just right, everything's so uniform, you know, new wax is, is just a brand new white when the bees secrete it, you know, by the time they've made comb out of it, it's a real pale yellow, but we see these nice, clean new frames. This really makes me happy to see these in the spring. It's just kind of the sign of vibrancy in life, just like we see plants get green and, and things are alive and growing. When you when you see frames of white, brand new wax like this in a colony, it's a sign of, it's a sign of good health, it's a sign of growth, um, it's a sign of, you know, your colony is going the right direction. Um, so, as much as I like that last frame and that makes me happy, um, you do find frames like this as well, um, where, you know, the bees don't always do what we want them to do. Um, and you end up with these lobes of uh, burr comb. They haven't really attached it to the frame, to the foundation. They kind of make this phantom comb that, that fits their architecture more than ours. Um, some, some of this can be if you have, like if you use foundation, there's imperfections or something on that, that can, that can kind of lead to comb irregularities. Also, if you've got a lot of, uh, foundation frames adjacent to each other and they're not, um, you know, they're not pushed in real tight. If you get a wider space, the bees will kind of see that as an opportunity to fill that with this, you know, burr comb where they want it instead of this nice, neat, uniform Langstroth frame where things are, you know, nicely dimensioned and nicely spaced out. So, um, typically when I find this in a brand new frame, I'll cut that out, um, and kind of give them a chance to try again. I also want to, if I'm getting new frames drawn, ideally I like putting those new frames between two frames that are drawn and drawn with nice, clean, straight parallel. So, um, kind of hemming the bees in as far as like, it's to their, the only, the best way for them to build is, is a nice uniform comb like I want. So, it, you know, future working the hive, I don't have these things that, um, interfere with getting frames out, you know, I'm, it's mashing against the next frame, it's squishing bees, it's creating a big sticky mess. Um, so getting comb drawn in this time, um, you know, I say I, I view May and June as really wax building season. Um, I know beekeepers in some places, if you have really strong flows later in the year, they will um, you know, you can get frames drawn out later in the season, but this is really the, the prime time for it, um, certainly in, you know, lower central Michigan. Um, the next issue to talk about is um, space in the hive. And, and as Megan mentioned, with the resources coming in and we see um, 
you know, backfilling in the broodness. We have, you know, this queen, our colony is in growth mode. Their population is really booming. And that queen is firing off, you know, a thousand plus eggs a day. Um, you know, she needs that, that space clear to be able to do that in order to not feel crowded. If there's a lot of resources coming in, like there is right now, there's a lot of nectar coming into colonies. Um, and they don't have space to put it out around the perimeter and up above the brood nest. It ends up getting stored in and amongst the brood cells when a when a cap cell um, emerges. That instead of the queen going back and laying an egg in that, it might get filled with nectar. And if that happens a lot, you end up with this kind of congested, crowded brood nest where you pull a frame of brood and like here we see kind of this cap brood on the perimeter. But as these bees are emerging in the center, it's getting filled in with nectar and those shiny cells we see. Um, so we want to, as a beekeeper, um, you know, there are some things we can do to alleviate this and, and give our colony space. Um, one of those is just adding, um, adding drawn comb. You know, if you have drawn comb, adding supers to your colony. Um, that's a real, it's a real benefit because it gives the bee, you know, their natural inclination. They want to put that honey up above the brood nest. So if you, you give them that space to do that, that decreases the amount of nectar, incoming nectar that ends up in the brood nest, congesting, crowding your queen where you could lead to a, you know, as we're, we're getting sort of towards the end of the reproductive swarming season, um, the, the crowding swarms are largely preventable. So um, this this is a case here. This is a, a, a lid that's popped off with a, with a rim on it. And we see, you know, this colony is just packed out. They fill every little space with honey. Um, and, and what this colony really needed was, was more space on top of, you know, supers a few weeks ago, realistically, you know, this honey now is, it's, it's crowded. It may be honey bound where that brood nest is getting really constricted. It may issue a, a um, like a, a, a swarm later in the season because of crowding. So that's kind of a, um, you know, that's something we can largely alleviate with management. It's better to be out front of the bees with giving them space, especially in this time of year when it's, you know, there's a lot of bee season ahead of us. Give them space when in doubt, better they have a little too much right now than, than not enough. And you come back in a week and it's, oh, there was a big flow that kind of caught you off guard. And now you end up with this. Um, so you will see one place you'll expect to see, and it's not necessarily a sign of crowding, is like if you run a two or a three box brood chamber and you split those boxes apart, it's very normal to see um, brood cells that are kind of built between the top bar and bottom bar of, of the two hives, particularly drone cells. Um, and your colony wants to just naturally colonies, um, you know, especially this time of year, big, strong colonies, they're thinking about reproduction. They're producing a lot of drones. It's a natural place for them to put drones and left to its own devices. A colony is, I, I think the number is somewhere around 15%. Um, drone comb that they would have and with beekeeping and foundation with all worker brood size foundation we've kind of limited the areas where they can build build those drone cells so one of the places they tend to do it is between boxes so if you split boxes and you see drone comb between frames that's pretty natural and normal for um, you know a good strong healthy colony in the spring that's not necessarily a sign that they're they're too crowded um, but if you're seeing like this picture where you've got man you pop the lid off and there's just honey using and dripping out everywhere that colony needs more space you see back filling in the brood nest with the nectar that colony needs more space thanks dan all right next we're going to talk a little bit about managing varroa mites um, so just a reminder that we have a lot of resources that we compile on our website. So if you go to pollinators at msu.edu and then find the beekeepers page, um, we have a place that says rural resources. I also put the URL on the screen here. Um, but basically, we have information on uh, identifying what it looks like when a colony is lost to rural mites. We have information on how to monitor rural mites. And then we have information on managing them. Um, so a great resource that's pretty comprehensive and thorough is the Honeybee Health Coalition's Tools for Varroa Management Guide, uh, and that's also linked on our website. Uh, it's a free PDF online. It goes through your different management options. It also gives a lot of background information around varroa mites. Um, as far as monitoring goes, we're going to encourage a lot of beekeepers to try to start 
keep uh, monitoring pyrrolamides early in the season. And so this is partly so that you kind of get a baseline and know what your mite levels are. This time of the year, there are some times where we're surprised that mite levels are a little bit higher than we'd expect them to be early in the spring, uh, but also because it can take a lot of practice. So if you're not used to scooping these for tests and running uh, an alcohol wash test or a powdered sugar roll test, it most beekeepers are not um, pros or great at it their first few times. So it takes some practice to make sure that you have the right number of bees in your um, your cup or your sampling scoop, and then to actually run the test. And so you can use the alcohol wash test or the powdered sugar roll test. Uh, the powdered sugar roll test can have its limitations, especially if there's nectar that gets on the bees, then the powdered sugar can kind of dissolve and get sticky. Um, so for um, the most accuracy, you would probably go with the alcohol wash test, but either test is fine depending on your preferences as long as the bees don't get too sticky in that powdered sugar roll test. Uh, there's a lot of videos of how to run these tests. We also teach how to do this monitoring in our in-hive workshops, um, but you'll find vi videos on our page about mites and um, you can go through it, do it a few times and do some practices so you get good at knowing what your mite levels are at this time of year. All right. And so um, as far as, you know, if you're going to consider a treatment option, there's lots of different options. The Honeybee Health Coalition's guide goes through each of the different options. They also have a tool on their website that talks about, asks you questions, and based off your responses, it will tell you which treatments are options for you. Um, but just a few common situations that we'll run through right now. So if you have honey supers on your colony, so that means you have boxes where you're collecting honey that you intend to be for human consumption, then there's you're limited in which treatments you can use. So those are going to be your formic acid treatments like formic pro or mitoate cook strips, hop guard um, three or a, another variety of hop guard, and then oxalic acid. So um, the issue is that there's some treatments that are not allowed for use with honey supers on, like our time wall based treatments, and we want to not use those if it's um, you know if they can't be used when we have honey supers on. So the thing to, in order to really know more about these in this information, you can use the Honeybee Health Coalition's guide, but you should also read the label in its entirety so you know the specific restrictions um, and you're double checking everything here. This is just kind of an overview. Um, another uh, common treatment situation that we see this time of year is small colonies. So if you just bought a nucleus colony or a package colony, or you did a, um, for some reason, a colony that's a really small split, you'll be limited in the treatment options because some of our treatments are really better for larger, stronger colonies. So colonies that are big in population. So the treatment options for small colonies would be hop guard three, um, where you can apply one strip for five frames covered with bees. Um, oxalic acid, um, where you apply five milliliters of the solution that's oxalic acid mixed with sugar syrup, um, but in, in between each seam of bees in the brood box up to 50 milliliters. And then apovar, which you, where you do one strip per five frames of bees. So all of the language on the slide is taken from the label. Uh, for more information and for the full explanation of how to apply these products, you should read the label. Uh, but the, just to get you started, these would be some of your treatment options if you're looking to treat a small colony. All right, uh, we have a program evaluation survey. It should you should see it when you close the um, the Zoom window tonight. And then now we've gotten to our part about answering your questions. So I can see we already have a few questions in the Q&A box. Um, I'll also mention that when you see the Q&A box through your Zoom controls, we do sometimes answer some of those questions by typing. So you should be able to see answered questions and check there um, if you're looking for a response too. All right, Megan, take it away. All right, I'm gonna start with, um... One that um, I did request some follow-up information. So if that um, comes through, then we'll um, provide more follow-up information. But someone said that they have signs of fall brood and it was on two frames, which I removed. And the question is, can the bees survive this or should I destroy the hive? It's a new package installed three weeks ago. Um, so I'm gonna take this one because I love fall brood. And it, the, the answer is that it depends. Um, and that's why I asked for some more follow-up. So we do have some resources, um, which I'll add to the chat once I stop talking, um, about how to investigate American fall brood. If you do think it's American fall brood, you would want to remove 
all of the frames. Um, you can do a shook swarm this time of year where you shake the bees onto brand new foundation, and that can be accompanied with antibiotics. It doesn't necessarily have to be, but if you're not using antibiotics, you have to check very, very closely. Um, if it's European fall brood, you don't necessarily have to destroy all the frames in the hive, but what we have found is that if you just pull out the frames that have disease brood on them, that may not be sufficient to get rid of it from your operation entirely. Um, it is pretty rare to have fall brood in a brand new package that's um, just installed. Another thing that could be happening is you can get chilled brood. Um, because we did have some really, really cold weather, and sometimes that can look pretty bad too. Um, so one of the things that you can do is send photos through the um, questions page, and so we can help you answer that. So if you can take photos of if you suspect fall brood, and then we can help you figure out what it is and then give you recommendations based on that. All right, um, I have a question for Dan bit, um, regarding building comb. Is last year's capped honey just as good for food and or for comb building? Yeah, and I'm I'm open to other thoughts on this. Um, I I think it's in in one sense they do need the nectar or honey to physically have the energy to secrete wax. Um, I also think there's something to that's telling them it's time to make wax at spring because there are resources coming in from the environment. So I, I, I would defer, if Megan, if you have um, more thoughts on that, but I think there is a, to some degree, it's triggered by what's happening in the environment um, as well. No, I agree. Um, so in terms of it, honey being just enough for food, it's definitely enough for food, mm -hmm. but it doesn't trigger the wax building. Um, but Randy Oliver did do a little comparison about whether or not it has to be like light nectar or thick. So whether or not you do two to one sugar or one to one sugar and you get just about the same amount of wax um, either way. But if you do one to one, you have to bring out more buckets, but it's easier. So but it is an incoming syrup is different from stored honey in terms of drawing it out. But both of them are good for feeding. Um. On the question of drone comb between the frames, um, Lori asks, will using a drone comb frame in the hive prevent bees from drill building drone comb between the boxes, or will they just build it in either place? I, it, it may um, reduce or mitigate, but I, I don't, it's, it's hard to prevent bees from doing anything. It, you may, you know, you may end up with most of it on your drone frames, but I, I you would, probably still see some between um, colleagues. I, I haven't used the drone frames extensively, so I don't really know, but my suspicion would be um, that you would probably still end up with some there, even with full utilized drone frames. And I do use drone frames somewhat, but more effectively, I use um, mouse damaged frames a lot in my brood nest. So I have lots of comb that they can build drone brood in. Um, and I, it doesn't completely eliminate it, but it basically does. Um, you can get rid of the drone brood, but it has to be enough. So one or one or two frames of either a medium in a deep box or a green frame or just a foundationless frame. Um, there is a question about for Anna. If you don't, if you did not use all of the oxalic acid for the oxalic acid drip, can you store it for later use? No, everything I've heard is, no, you should try to use it within a day or so of mixing it. Can you agree, Megan? Yeah, it doesn't. And it, it does depend on what water you use. Um, but basically, it'll just make it in, ineffective. Um, Dan, do you want to do... Uh, so I installed my package on May 8th. Um, I will be doing my third inspection in two weeks. What should they be looking for? Yeah, so presumably you've already done a second inspection here. So I'm assuming you're queen, right? You've seen it. You know, if your third inspection is coming up in two weeks, that's going to be a month old at that point. Um, 
So at that point, your package should be actually having emerged new bees. But anytime you inspect the colony, we're thinking of, you know, we want to verify our queen status. So that's looking for eggs. We don't need to see her. We just need to see evidence of her. We want to check for any signs of disease, parasites, pests. We want to make sure they've got food, um, at, you know, adequate food resources and space. So by the time your package is a month old or, yeah, about a month old, I guess, then in two weeks from now, um, you should have a good number of emerging bees. Like you, she was installed within, you know, several days. They should get some wax drawn, laying eggs. So by four plus weeks in, you should have good emergence. So you should actually start to see your population grow. So you want to kind of get a sense of how much brood you have in the colony, how that population is growing. Um, you know, if they're in one box, the kind of rule of thumb is when they get to in the in the vicinity of 70% or so full in the equipment in, you can add another box. Again, with the space, better to add it too soon than too late, especially in this growth time of year. Um, but yeah, main thing is just verifying you've still got eggs and your brood is looking good and you're keeping out in front of the population um, as far as giving them the space they need in this this time of year. Excellent. Um... And then we, we've had a couple questions of beekeepers looking for resources. Um, and so someone is saying that they're looking for a mentor and someone else requested that they are looking for someone to give a talk at their school. Um, and we would love it if we had more people with extension appointments scattered throughout the state. One of the reasons we do the webinars is because we can't be everywhere. Um, and we don't have enough people, but this is where our partnership with the bee clubs really becomes handy. Um, so I'm going to put in the chat again, the listing of the local bee clubs. Oh, Anna just did. Um, oh, no, just to us. <laughs> okay. okay, so, um, but a lot of the bee clubs do have people that do standing, um, that will work as mentors and a lot of the bee clubs will have people that will go out and talk to schools. Um, so those would really be the best bet for that. Um, and we actually just have one more question in the chat unless people want to um, keep adding some. Oh, there we yeah. go. And Megan, I'll just add to that last answer. So we did just write an article called Getting Started with Beekeeping in Michigan, where we have, um, so it's not just for new beekeepers, it's also for lots of beekeepers in our state, it lists the resources that we have. Um, so that's a good place to go to if you're looking for more information. I'll put the link in the chat. Okay, perfect. Um, and then someone asks, I've always understood that once there are sealed queen swarm cells in the hive, most likely the hive has swarm and the original queen with, but I've made 12 splits so far, yay. And three of the hives had sealed swarm cells and still the queen. Thoughts? Um, I'll do this one first and then other people can chip in. So the way that I was taught and what I've seen is anytime after this um, cell is capped, the queen can leave. So not necessarily that she most likely has left um, because she does have a pretty good window and they will wait for good weather. And I think this spring, we had such a cold, long, drawn out period. So we had that warm up in April, and then it was just cold with no food coming in for such a long time that it really did slow down swarming quite a bit. Um, so they can, after it's capped, they can leave, but there will still be a window um, that she should leave. So you are probably making all of your splits right in the, the window. Um, all right. Reasons for cross combing and ways to deal with it. Dan, do you want to answer that one? Yeah. And, and I don't have great answers other than, you know, if, especially if you've got multiple frames adjacent that you're trying to get drawn out, just making sure they are tight together. Even in that case, sometimes they're going to decide to cross comb, but it really is about, um, you know, maintaining proper bee space your frame dimension is a very specific it's not accidental um, the dimension of those frames so having them tight together helps if you have less comb to draw um you know if it's only a frame or two per box i like to put a the foundation in between two already drawn frames that are, are nice straight frames and really tighten it up so it's kind of a 
encouraging them to do what you want. It's not a hundred percent. They're still sometimes going to make comb you don't like, but it really is about the spacing and getting things tight together to, to minimize it. Um, yeah. And then there is a question it's asking for the evidence that stadium oxalic acid is safe for honey supers and the consumption of that honey. Um, Anna, do you feel comfortable with that one? Um, why don't you take it? I'm fixing something real quick. Yeah. So with the, with the oxalic acid, um, the, there isn't, so first off, oxalic acid is commonly found in foods. Um, so like if you eat a bunch of spinach, that dry feeling in your mouth is oxalic acid. There is not, they didn't do a lot of studies as far as I know, looking at specifically the safe, the safe levels that would be found in honey. What they did is they looked at the levels that are, would be in honey after an application and found that it's not higher than what would be in other foods that you normally consume in your diet. Um, and so that's why they, um, the label now allows that you can use them while honey supers are on. So that is a fairly new change that they um, are, that you're able to use it while honey supers are on. Um, all right. Let's see. Oh, can you go over walk away or dirty splits again? Anna, do you want to do that one? Sure. So that's um, this is the idea that you're just kind of splitting the hive in two and then letting one of the new ones raise a queen and then the queen stays in one of the hives. So there's lots of different ways to do it. Um, really, the main thing is that which whatever ones you uh, you want to make sure if you're not finding the queen and you don't know where the queen is, you want to make sure that both of them have the potential to raise a queen. So we're looking for frames with eggs or young brood and that they also have brood and uh, food. So stored honey and pollen. And so as long as they have those things, you're um, it doesn't really matter where the queen goes. You're just letting one raise a new queen and then the other one will um, hopefully have the queen. You'd expect that. Um, if you're doing the split in the same yard, that a lot of the foragers will return to that original hive location. So that hive will be more populated with bees than the new hive location. Um, so sometimes to compensate for that, you move more bees to the new site with the understanding that a lot of them will return to that original hive. Uh, there's a couple cool or in, um, interesting ideas or techniques that Megan will sometimes teach. So one is where you mark every other frame, you know, you can take a marker and just dot every other frame in the hive. And then you move all the frames with dots over to a new, a new hive. And that helps to make sure that, you know, both hives have um, adequate resources in terms of brood and food. Um, so that's one way to do it. And then there's other ways as well. I know some beekeepers will just take one box and move it over and leave one box in the location. But again, you just want to make sure that every hive has the ingredients for raising a new a new queen. So young brood, different stages of brood, and then stored food and plenty of bees. Great. Um, so there is another question about people who are still struggling to find networking resources and don't have a bee club in their area. Um, and which is true, like, one thing you can do is start a bee club in your area. And that's something that, um, the MBA can help you with, or we can help you talk through how it's done. And you don't have to be a good beekeeper to start a bee club. Um, you just have to be a good starting a club person. But Robin mentioned that um, the Michigan Beekeepers Association is working on a program with volunteers um, to visit schools, libraries for bee education. So um, for, for both of those, even if you don't have a local club, if you're looking for someone to give a talk or if you're looking for a mentor, make sure you join the state organization because they can help you with um, resources as well. And I would say the best thing would just be to sign up for the MBA newsletter on that. Um, there is a question that says, when should queen excluders be used? <laughs> <laughs> which I'm just laughing because the, we have different answers to this, um, which I think the the S word is the one, the should is the issue with that. Mm -hmm. um, so Rick's asking specifically, starting with splits with two deeps, does excluders impact the queen mating process? For example, if she enters in the upper entrance versus the bottom entrance. So maybe we can answer the the first, I guess the, the second question first is, 
Um, if you have, if anyone's noticed, if there's, if you have upper entrances, if there's an issue of the queen, perhaps having issues with mating. Dan or Anna, have you heard of that? Uh, no, but I'm typically not. I typically don't have supers on a hive where I'm still trying to get a queen right and up to strength in the spring. That's like supers are later um, for me. So I, yeah, I can't say I have experience with that. And and I would say the same. I don't necessarily know that there is a lot of evidence that she would go into an upper entrance versus a bottom entrance. I'm sure it's happened because they can do whatever they want. But I would say in most cases, when people do things regularly, they're not having a mating issue while they're also in, in honey production. Um, yes, I would agree with that. Anna, do you have a follow-up? And then do you want to talk about when you think queen excluders should be used? Um, I mean, just follow up, I guess, if you could always close that upper entrance if you think that you're having yeah. a queen um, to, yeah, alleviate some of those worries. Um, but yeah, for the, the question about queen excluders, so I'll give you my take and then others will give you their takes. Um, so here is why I like queen excluders. I like queen excluders because it normally means that the combs that are in the honey supers, so everything above the queen excluder is going to just be used for storing nectar and honey. Um, it makes it really easy when you're harvesting honey to pull that honey off and not worry that you have brood in them or that you are accidentally pulling the queen while you're um, pulling those boxes for extraction. And then also I like it because it the, the comb stores really nicely. So oftentimes we're recommending that comb that's used for brood gets rotated out every few years or, you know, I think Megan says every six years or so as a goal. But the the issue so um, so the issue with comb and brood is that there's um, different things that can build up in that brood comb, whereas honey, comb that's just used for storing nectar and honey tends to stay pretty clean and usable for many many years. So it also makes it easy to store that honey super comb because it's less attractive to different pests because it doesn't have those pupil cocoons um, or pollen or other things that the pests might want to feed on and then subsequently destroy or ruin frames. Um, so those are the reasons that I can think of for using a queen excluder. Um, Dan, do you have anything to add there? We do use queen excluders in our operation. Yeah, no, I, yep. As far as the pros, I, yeah, I think, yep. I think you covered them. And then I'll do, the, the I'll do the cons because I'm the two to one. Um, and I'm not against them. And on this point, actually, she did convince me about storing comb that doesn't have the protein in them. That is a really big one because it does make comb easier to store. Um, however, the bees definitely don't always like going through queen excluders. And I grew up calling them honey excluders because that's how I was taught. Um, and it took me a really long time to even be able to use the term correctly. I do think they are um, one of the issues. So we're going to go out tomorrow and see why the colony on campus swarmed. But I have definitely seen that situation where the bees would rather put the honey down in the brood nest than bring it up through a queen excluder, especially this time of year when it's coming in really fast. The other thing is they don't draw comb through a queen excluder. So they'll do a little bit. Like if you have a bunch of drawn comb up above it, they'll go through it. But sometimes they just hate going through it, even if you have an upper entrance, especially like right now, if the colony isn't enormous, so it spans, if the, the like the cluster doesn't span all the way up above the queen excluder and they're just bringing in a lot of nectar. Um, I've definitely had issues where they just backfill rather than going up through. And especially if you're trying to get them to draw. So um, I, I do use them for making splits, but I don't always use them throughout my operation. Um, or I don't use them at this time of year. I'll maybe put them on a little bit later. Yeah, that's a really good point. If we luckily, you know, we have drawn comb in our supers. And so we might put some frames of foundation in to get them drawn. But if you were to put a queen excluder on and then a box full of foundation with no drawn comb, the bees would likely be very mm -hmm. reluctant to go up and draw. Mm -hmm. And and one thing else, as Megan mentioned, sometimes you just get a colony that's reluctant to go up, even if there's drawn comb, they kind of decide we're just going to pack out the brood nest. Um, one thing I've found a little bit useful to alleviate that is um, opening up that the top of the brood nest. If they start to get a good band of honey across the top, they don't like to go across that. 
Um, so if it's bringing a frame or two from the bottom box, that's more, you know, mid brood nest without a honey cap on it. Um, that can help open the kind of take the ceiling off, so to speak. Another way is if if I've got other colonies in the yard and I'll take a couple frames of open nectar from a, another super and put it in that colony, then they've got they've got open nectar they've got to draw and that draws the bees up. That's enough to get them started, get them working. Um, so I have, yeah, occasionally there's a colony that is a little stubborn about going up and those are just some little things management wise that I found it kind of hopes them to do what I want to do. Megan, did the amp sound go out a little bit? No, it sounds okay for mine. Okay, it's just me. Um, and then someone did ask, Anna, do you think you have any issues with honey reduction while you're using the clean excluder? Probably to some extent, but we haven't really done a side-by-side -side comparison and quantified it. But we also do have a lot of honey in the brood nest going into winter, so that's good for that situation. We also do feed heavy syrup in the fall, though, for before winter as well. Um, all right. So someone is still asking about the cross. So let's say, let's say, for example, you do have a lot of cross combs or a really messy comb this time of year. Um, should you just cut it or should you try to pull them apart or what should you do? I, I usually cut it out and hope they do better on a second chance. If you've got, you know, if you're talking true cross comb that is really perpendicular, like fixing two frames together, they're not going to, on their own, they're not going to then morph that architecture into parallel to the frame. Um, so, uh, yeah, my, my inclination is to cut it out. And um, and they may not draw that back perfectly, but, if you know, if I start to get some frames where, you know, the comb is a little irregular, I'm also generally trying to work those frames to the outside of the box. Um, I tend to put my more irregular combs to the outside. They're more, it's a little less problematic as a food frame. Um, it's less likely the queen's going to be out there if I pull an outside frame, um, you know, and it's those ones with remnants of cross comb or irregular comb that tend to be more messy to get out sometimes. Um, so that's how I handle it. I cut it out and hope they do better next time. And I'll just add if I can. So the, the main goal is that you're able to inspect the colony. So, I mean, it can be a lot of personal preference, but as long as you're able to remove frames and inspect the colony, you, you can put up with some bird comb. The nice thing about removing that cross comb right now, though, is that we're at a time of year where bees are drawing comb. So um, if you do that later in the fall, then they're just not going to rebuild it. And I would say the the other option is if it's like the only thing that they've made is the cross comb and like tearing it apart right now is going to tear apart everything. Um, you could just put another box on, make sure that the next box is much neater and wait till next year. Because, it, you know, after next winter, the bees should be up out of that bottom box and then you can just completely take it apart once the bees are out of it. Um, so like if they've just made a terrible mess and you won't be able to do it without ruining everything, you can wait until next year, but, um, you know, and hopefully that the, the one above it, you'll be able to inspect and get all your information from that. Um, Lisa gave us a really tough question. Um, and I'm actually curious to see what other people say too. So she caged to queen for five minutes with attendance while she was doing a split, which is something they've done multiple, countless times. When she returned the queen to her portion of the split, they immediately balled her and killed her. What gives and why did this happen? Um, Dan, I'll put you on the spot first. Um, bees do what they do and we don't know all the time. I don't, um, I don't have a great answer. I mean, it could be something that um, there was a scent they didn't like on her. Maybe she got damaged, but it, I don't think that's a common thing. Um, I will say usually if I find a queen and we're working the hive, usually she goes in a cage without attendants. Um, but again, assuming you're pulling attendants out of, you know, her hive and introducing her back into part of her hive. I, yeah, I don't have a, a great answer. My thought would be something scent driven, but that's, that's as far as I can go with it. I have a guess that I don't think it was a person situation, but I'll share it because it, it almost happened to us this year. Because we also, um, when we do our splits, often we'll find the queen, put her in a cage, 
so that we know where the queen is and then we can decide which frames we pull out for nukes. Yeah. <laughs> And um, you got to be careful that you don't forget to put the last queen back in the right hive and that you're not mixing up, if especially if, like we were doing it with clothes, we we're kind of keeping them in our pocket, the like, caged queens in our pocket. So I don't think this is this person's situation, but if you accidentally switched up your queens and that queen was from another hive, that could be your reason why. Um, yeah. And I don't know, Megan, one thing I've wondered about is, you know, if you're handling multiple queens throughout the day, if you're spreading queen pheromones around from queen to queen. Yeah, I definitely have had it where I've handled so many queens in a day that like I can tell my hands smell queenie and everybody's really interested. Um, I have had the situation where colonies have bald queens. And in one case, it was um, I think it was the colony was so like there was a lot of, and again, this isn't common for this time of year, but there was a lot of robbing and a lot of aggression and a lot of alarm pheromone for other like destructive reasons. So like maybe if you had squashed a lot of bees, they could be kind of aggressive at that moment. I have had a situation where bees from, so I had neighboring nukes and bees from one hive that could, when I took the nukes apart, um, they were I was introducing queens that were completely like not related and the bees from one hive were going over and killing the queens and the other one because they could go it was like those Michael Palmer style ones and actually workers were coming from another nuke um but in, I mean the fact that you said you've done it many times without a problem is kind of it might just be one of those weird things that you know, there was a lot of alarm pheromone or, you know, hopefully you didn't put the wrong queen back in the hive, but I like how we're laughing because these are things that we've done. Um, uh, and then also, uh, yeah, it, it could just be different, different bees that could be coming in. And it, it also could have been, you know, maybe that colony was a colony that, um, you know, had superseded, you know, if there's a new queen that um, there, they'll kill the old queen. Sometimes they don't kill her immediately. So maybe, it was a situation like that where there was a, another queen in that hive. Yeah, like, that's yeah. totally fair. So it's probably just something that like bees don't always do exactly what we predict them to do. Yeah. Um, okay. And then someone gave a situation where they had a queen laying in the top box, honey bound in the bottom. So they put her, and I believe the way they're saying it is that the queen was above the queen excluder. So I put her in some brood frames and open in the bottom, checkerboarded frames on top to keep her in the bottom. Was that a good solution or should I have done something different? Um, but putting her down, for me, putting her down below and giving them some space feels really good. Um, I think one thing that is really important is that when you're estimating the amount of space they need after they are nectar bound or honey bound, it's a lot more than you think because you have to account for all of the nectar that's still coming in plus all of the nectar in that box. So if they've got a box filled, you know, you may have to put another. So maybe just checkerboarding might not be sufficient in order to draw um, all of that nectar off plus account for more coming in. All right. I don't see any more questions. Um, we're a little after eight. Someone did ask where to send the pet photos. You can send any and all cute animal photos. Plus, or if you have something really good and you're happy that we use photos for teaching, um, you can send it to honeybees at msu.edu. So um, thanks everyone for your attention and for all your great questions. And we'll hopefully see you at the next month's webinar, if not sooner. Thanks, everyone. Have a great yep. night. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye.